Welcome back to The Last Frontier. In this episode, we're picking up where we last left you, avoiding the touristy areas of Alaska, and instead exploring the lesser known back roads and trails in hopes of rediscovering a piece or two of Alaska's forgotten history. We have an ambitious goal this time around, with lots of miles to cover and potential routes to try. But little did we know, things are about to go sideways and throw a wrench in our best laid plans. But for now, We've made our way to the northern half of Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve in search of two historical gold mines. Mixed reports in our research suggest that the last section of trail is in questionable condition, and so we've made our way to this point for a first hand inspection. And it's pretty clear, legal route or not, it's certainly not an easy one. Oh, that's why. Yeah, there's just one big nasty mud hole up here. Looks like people have thrown all kinds of trash in it trying to get out, so probably not worth it. Okay. I'm gonna play it safe on this one. That's that's a nasty little mud hole, and I think there's a lot of junk down in the bottom where people have tried it and gotten stuck. So who knows what you'll jam up into your undercarriage trying to make it across. Not to mention there's like parts of a rusty culvert on top of that, so why risk it at this stage? But we might we might go check it out later on foot. Since it was getting late in the day, we decided to backtrack to a wild camp that we had marked earlier. Our plan was to get some rest and then head out early in the morning to hike the old trails on foot since we didn't want to push our luck in the rented Tacoma. All right, well, we've made it to camp, and we're in a bit of a swampy area, but we're also in Alaska, so it's just going to be a struggle to stay mosquito-free. There's no perfect solution, but the one thing that we've gravitated towards in our travels up here has been these thermocells that attach to the jet boil style gas canisters. You got a little wafer that sits on top of a heating pad here and it just warms it ever so slightly and within 15 or 20 minutes it's incredible how many mosquitoes disappear now you might not be able to see it behind me but there's probably 20 or 30 already buzzing around because they've been following the exhaust fumes from the truck so if you're coming to alaska this is one little handy trick that you can use to help knock them down. Now they also have USB powered versions now. They have the smaller butane powered versions and the gas ones don't work great at altitude. So if you're going to be at high altitude, look at the USB styles, but these are going to work for us just fine tonight. So we're basically going to pop smoke, throw these outside, sit in the truck for a few minutes, let it activity die down and then commence to set up camp. You ready? Pop and smoke! Alright, here we go. Pop them out! Grenade! Grenade! Alright, well, they're starting to do their job over here, but I'm just gonna walk away from our little thermocell cloud for a second. This is a cool little place in here. I just happened to glance over and saw this little two track shooting into the scrub. There's a nice little camp spot here, and then the, the two track kind of keeps going. Now obviously another thing that you want to be mindful of here in Alaska is moose and bears. Now we always get the question, should I take a firearm to Alaska? And my response is always, if you're familiar with firearms, then yes. If you are not, more than likely you're going to be more of a danger to those around you. So. I would highly recommend either way bear spray keeping your scents really low so cook and clean up immediately or better yet cook before you get to camp and then just go to bed when you get to camp and being situationally aware find yourself always looking about what's going on where am I where's my kids where's my dog and just keeping your head on a swivel because if you can spot things early, if you can find those situations before they get dangerous, 
That's the key. All right, so you can see the mosquitoes have pretty much vacated the truck area now. So it's time to set us up. All right, so I figured I'd address the elephant in the room, the big gray elephant sitting behind me. No, we did not bring our own rig up here for multiple reasons. If you're following us on Patreon, I've already explained our strategy behind our Alaska methods, but 10 days of drive time to and from Alaska or $10,000 ferry ride with one of our vehicles in the trailer. So think about the downtime, think about the expense. It was a lot cheaper and a lot easier to simply hop on Alaskan Airlines, fly in Anchorage, and hop in this amazing Tacoma by Alaska Overlander. Now, if you've been following the channel for any amount of time, you know that last year we did the same thing, except we were in a white 4Runner. So if you're considering Alaska, it's a mouthful. It is a lot to commit to. But we came up with a pretty cool solution. So thank you, Craig and Brooke, for being there for us yet again and for letting us try out your new truck, Nanana which is a Tacoma and is a whole new footprint for our family. So it's been interesting to try something new. Now, we gotta get cooking supper now. Mama's ready, she's done. You done? Yeah, I'm hungry. All right, enough talking. Let's make some of our super fast meals. Sarah, do you wanna talk a little bit about our strategy? So the strategy was that we were coming to see Alaska, not eat Alaska. <laughs> and last year, I did what I normally do, just picked out groceries and things to cook. And we did good eating all of our groceries, mm -hmm. but it took up a lot of space in the Forerunner. So this time, Kev was like, listen, we have a whole box of these at home. Six years old. Pick out some of them and let's take them up. We'll eat through them. If we need more, we'll stop and find a place that has more. My goal was this is mostly, actually, this is all our dinners. Maybe we'll eat out a time or two. Yeah, but then lunch was going to be fresh. And then we have like fresh fruit and vegetables mm -hmm. and things like that to kind of supplement. But yeah. these really do kind of get a bad rap, but actually they're really good. And there's nothing that makes me feel appalled eating them actually <laughs> yeah so you can use these as a core and then just add some fresh options on the side yeah bread is another good side for this type of stuff for sure so to really expand the meal experience without causing you to haul a bunch of extra stuff on the rig right then once you got a hold on me she's the warmth of the summer the color of the spring she's the strongest wind the calmest breeze and once you got a hold on That girl, she's like Ooh, the finest wine She'll give you a taste if you give her a good time She's a complex heart and I don't mind That girl, she's like the finest Good morning, folks. Or maybe it's afternoon. Bit of a slow start this morning for reasons which you can probably tell. I've got 101 fever and did not sleep great last night. A little bit achy all over. So that presents a lot of challenges, as you can imagine. So we're going to go up and see the mine while I feel mobile. Continue to take some Tylenol and whatnot, see how it goes, and then make a decision after that if i'm still rough we might bail out either head to fairbanks or even back to anchorage see if we can't head it off at the pass but that's part of travel 
that's part of doing what we do. It can happen at any given time, and um, it's important that you bring all the necessary stuff for when this does go down. We had a thermometer. We had an O2 sensor, so I knew that my O2 levels are down, like 92, 93, and then medicines as well. So, gotta be prepared for all that stuff. All right, let's back down camp while I'm still vertical and go see what we can see and then figure out what the next leg of this adventure looks like. Hopefully in the wilderness and not elsewhere. With the looming concern that we may be getting sick, we thought long and hard before making the hike out to the mines. Ultimately, I decided I felt mobile enough to give it a shot, mostly because I didn't want to waste the drive to this remote location without seeing what we had come to find. And so, we tightened up our hiking boots and began sloshing our way through the swampy areas before turning south to climb the White Mountains to the first stop along our five mile round trip hike. Mom, it's not raining. You don't need your, your hood up. <laughs> Get the mud, right? I know. Welcome to the Rambler Mine. Now there's very little information on this mine, but as best as we can tell, it seems to have been in operation during the early 1940s, and some documents suggest that prospecting activity was performed up until the 1980s. This mine is still privately owned and appears to have been converted into a hunting camp with some improvements that are helping to maintain the old structures. The coolest part about this mine is that there are still a lot of artifacts laying around, as if at any moment the miners could return and get back to work. Decent cabin. I know, it's not half bad. I don't know if that's circa 1940 or not. Big old generator. What do you guys think? The bear claw marks? He's up here sharpening his claw skills. After retracing our steps back down the mountain and hiking another mile and a half to the east, we arrived at a more impressive operation, the Nebesna Mine. Gold was discovered in this area back in the late 1890s, but the remoteness kept mining operations stifled with the sheer effort and expense required to extract the ore from the mountainsides. But in the case of this mine, one story says that an Alaskan native by the name of Nebesna John had found a rich gold vein when he stumbled upon a mound of pay dirt where a hungry bear was attempting to dig a marmot out of his hole. With this low discovery, he was successful enough on his own to support his family as he pecked away for a few years. But when a rush of prospectors came pouring in, it was apparent his secret wasn't going to last much longer. And so, in 1929, he entered into an, an agreement with Carl Whitham, who had the ability to begin mining in earnest, especially after the confirmation of the richness of the find. In fact, the quote-unquote bear vein, as they named it, was so lucrative that a road was built to give access for equipment 
and upwards of 70 miners to make their way to the find. While it wasn't in operation very long, reports say that over 10 years, over $1.8 million was mined from the claim. In 1947, Whitham died and the mine was permanently closed. But it apparently wasn't due to a lack of gold. It was actually due to the forced closure during World War II, followed by plummeting gold prices after the war, along with the rising expenses to extract it from the mountainside. There's still gold in its three miles of tunnels deep within the mountain, but it will most likely never see the light of day. Unfortunately, this operation left a nasty scar in this part of the wilderness from an incredible amount of pollution due to the cyanide leaching processes. Efforts are slowly underway to recover and renew the portions found on national park land, but sadly, the mining structures themselves are quickly deteriorating and will most likely collapse soon under another heavy winter snowfall. We count ourselves fortunate to have seen these before the inevitable happens, and in spite of the raging fever, headache, and burning lungs, this hike was well worth the effort. All right, folks. Well, wrapping up another day in the Alaskan wilderness. Nice long hike. Yeah. In spite of the Can't crud. Dying. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to play it safe tomorrow, though. We're going to head up to um, Fairbanks, get a little Airbnb for a couple days just to make sure this is all kicked thoroughly yeah. in the patootie. We're not going to risk it. Before we continue on. But we'll be at a good launching point in Fairbanks yes. to go and do the t one of the two or both the options got that we wanted to. Got a couple cool to. options that we're looking forward to. So, so yeah. it's a smart move. And we got some time. We got yeah. some time. It's not like we have 10 days like last year. Yeah. So. All right, let me go sleep. All right. Let's shut all this down. Yeah. I'll show you how dark this gets. It's a little bright. It's crazy. <laughs> and then... Good night. I haven't looked at myself yet. <laughs> Trust me, I don't think you can look any worse than me. Um, okay. That's sweet of you. Well... You never want an important trip like this to go this way, but we're going to have to pull the plug. We're headed to Fairbanks. Got an Airbnb lined up for a couple, three days and hopefully kick this. We had two choices. We could push it, hope we get to feeling better, but now a little bit back here is rough as well. So don't play it safe. Try to get healed up so we can continue on. But, uh, Nice spot right here. Very nice spot. Patrons, by the way, we've got a just a dump truck load of waypoints from this trip. So if you ever do come up here and decide to rent one of these from Alaska Overlander, you'll have the hookup. Alright, coffee. And then a five, six hour drive? Five hour. Five hour drive. To Fairbanks. Turns out getting a place to recoup was a good idea because winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> Is an adventure now? <laughs> 